members. Mr. Cahill Hushin has given notice of an urgent order question to the Minister of Environment. Uh, once again, I remind members that if they wish asked a supplementary, they should rise in their places continually. The member who tabled the question will automatically be called. And I know also the Minister has approached the table, and I know he's keen to get more time uh, to answer the question, and I can understand the nature of the question. Uh, and I would ask the clerk to please read the question. To ask the Minister of the Environment to outline what steps he has taken, including any discussions with the Minister of Finance and Personnel, to ensure that the 300 driver <coughs> and personnel agency workers will be retained within the civil service. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As members are aware, the Secretary of State for Transport announced on the 13th of March that vehicle licensing services for motorists in Northern Ireland are to be centralised in Swansea. From July this year, the Department for Transport, which has responsibility for this accepted matter, intends to replace the Northern Ireland IT system for vehicle licensing with the system used in GB. This will extend online and enhanced post office services here to Northern Ireland. These services which have been available in Britain for a number of years, could have and should have been provided to motorists here many years ago. However, rather than investing in Northern Ireland, the DVLA in Swansea continually refused to develop the required technology to enable motorists here to have the same level of access to vehicle licensing services that has been available in Britain. The decision to centralise will result in the closure of all of DVA's vehicle licensing offices in Coleraine and in Belfast, Ballymena, Coleraine, Derry, Oma and Enniskillen, Armagh and Downpatrick. The work and funding for over 300 jobs will be lost. This is a devastating blow for all the hard-working staff of the DVA and their families, and also for motorists in Northern Ireland who have received a first-class service from the DVA. I have no doubt that the standards of service will diminish when DVLA try to deliver services remotely from Swansea. During the public consultation on these centralisation proposals, the motor trade and the motoring public demonstrated their overwhelming support for retaining local delivery of vehicle licensing and confirmed their high regard for the work of DVA. I am bitterly disappointed and angered by this decision, which represents nothing more than a narrowly focused cost-cutting exercise made at the expense of high-quality public services, jobs and to the detriment of our local economy. I am also extremely angry at the timing of the announcement. In spite of assurances from ministers in London that I would be informed in advance of any announcement, and notwithstanding that I made myself available to discuss this critical issue with London ministers at any time, it is disgraceful that the announcement was made whilst I was out of the country and officials were informed of the announcement only the night before. I am grateful for the support that I received from executive colleagues, members across this House and other public representatives. I also readily acknowledge the efforts of the staff in the DVA and their trade union. Customers and other stakeholders also played their part in making their opposition to centralisation in Swansea abundantly clear during the public consultation on the DVLA plans. But while we are all bitterly disappointed by this decision, I do not believe that there was anything further that we could have done to have turned Westminster from this misguided decision because of their blinkered focus on short-term financial gain. My primary responsibility will now be to bring some certainty to the affected staff in the DVA regarding their future employment. I have already written to executive colleagues seeking their assistance in identifying possible alternative work that could be located in the affected areas. I do not underestimate the difficulties in finding new work for staff, but I am confident that my executive colleagues will work with me in seeking to find a solution. There are opportunities to make use of a well-trained and highly committed workforce with a proven record of customer service and achievement. Obviously, the problem will be greatest for Coleraine, 
But although the numbers are small in the other areas with local motor tax offices, I appreciate that the opportunities for redeployment to other posts in the civil service will also be greatly restricted in some places. Finally, uh, Mr. Speaker, in trying to resolve the staffing issues created by this unwarranted decision to centralise all of this work in Swansea, I have already made it very clear that I expect the DVLA and the Department for Transport to provide whatever level of financial assistance is needed to facilitate the transfer of work or the redeployment of staff. I intend to do everything possible to ensure that London and Swansea face up fully to the consequences of this decision. I thank the Minister for his answer there, and I accept that the Minister acknowledges the hurt and pain caused by this move uh, to staff and indeed their families. But could I ask the Minister, Kim Coria, what efforts both he and his predecessor have made with British Transport Minister Hammond and others for the devolution and transfer of DVA to Korean and responsibilities to the Assembly? And it's also my understanding that last week a meeting with Minister Hammond had been organised. That did not happen, as I understand it. Was that meeting scheduled to inform the DOE Minister of the impending jobs uh, cuts? And indeed, when and where was he informed of those? As regards me being informed of the decision, it wasn't last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before I was told that Stephen Hammond would be phoning me at half three that afternoon. He was called into a meeting. It was a very long meeting. I didn't hear from him for eight days, despite the efforts from me to make contact with him. Completely, completely unacceptable. As regards the devolution of vehicle licensing powers, I and my party do support the devolution of taxation and fiscal powers. However, such has been the neglect of DVA here by DVLA, the cost of having that devolved at this moment would be too great. Because the IT system there has been allowed to run down so far, as well as the actual cost of providing the service here from uh, Northern Ireland, we'd be talking huge amounts of millions of pounds in order to do that. That's even considering if the willingness was there to devolve this from London. And any attempt that I have made to ascertain as to whether it is or not has been met with a negative response. George Robinson. Mr. Robinson. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker uh, could I ask the Minister to state if any consideration will be given to the financial impact not only on DBLA staff but on local car dealers? and TransLink's ability to detax 700 plus uh, buses over the school's summer holidays due to the ill-conceived and ludicrous proposal of the closure of DVLA, DVLA officers in Northern Ireland by an uncaring Mr. Mr. Government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Robinson, who described the member described the decision as ludicrous. And the more we hear about it and the impacts that it's going to have, the more ludicrous it will indeed seem. And I'm sure as every member stands up here today, it will seem more and more ludicrous. The issues that the member uh, refers to, the, the wider uh, impact on motor dealers, the motor trade, had been addressed in the submission that I made to uh, Westminster on this. The issue around the, the buses, I believe that TransLink themselves had actually responded to the consultation to flag up that issue. Mr. Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his comprehensive uh, response and an indication of his indignation at how he was treated. Uh, the Minister was not in Korean last Thursday to see at first hand the hurt, the distress, the, the sense of bewilderment that this happened. Can I ask the Minister to go back to Korean to meet those workers face to face? And will he do it after he has spoken to the First and Deputy First Ministers, who were given some kind of indication from the Prime Minister that he would deal with it 
sadly, regrettably, uh, disgracefully, he was in Israel talking about the peace process. Yes, I, I just want to thank the Minister for his solidarity with the workers and for refusing to accept it was a done deal from the beginning. Will he go back to Korean? Will he meet those people face to face? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank Mr. Dalit for his question. The anger that I feel and the anger that I have expressed about the manner in which I was informed of this decision is not because of some slight on me or disrespect to my post as Minister for the Environment here in the North. My anger is that I was not here and that I was not able to be in Coleraine Rain last Thursday morning with the workers to, to give them any assurance that I could that we will not be abandoning them, despite the fact that uh, the British government has clearly abandoned them in this case. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that. And could I firstly just put on record my thanks to the Minister and indeed his predecessor for, uh, for the way they tried to, to help the, the, the people in the jobs up in Coleraine and indeed throughout Northern Ireland. But I'm just wondering if the Minister can give us some detail for any of these members of staff who are fortunate enough to be redeployed to other civil service posts, what is a reasonable and acceptable travel distance for those uh, felt appropriate within the civil service regime that they would be expected to travel? I thank uh, the member for his question, which is uh, extremely pertinent. A lot of the workforce, the bulk of whom are uh, located in Coleraine, have caring responsibilities. Many of them actually work in part-time hours, so therefore a reasonable travel distance won't be that great for quite a lot of, 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 of these employees. I believe that we have to be creative, myself and my executive colleagues in many instances, of looking not what work that staff can be redeployed to, but maybe at what work can be redeployed to staff. And that's a point I will be making to staff when I visit them in the coming days. Uh, Stuart Dixon. Um, thank, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you for the answer which you have given to us. But we do recognise the loyalty of the staff in uh, the DVLNI, and uh, it is very difficult for those jobs now to be redeployed. Not only the large number of jobs in Coleraine, which you have highlighted as a particular issue, but there are jobs in other parts of Northern Ireland employed uh, in DVLNI, and also a great deal of inconvenience to the general public. What action will you be taking if you have accepted that this, de that this decision is now fait accompli? What action will you be taking to inform the public how the transition will take place? I thank uh, Mr Dixon for that question. Sure. The public can't have failed to be made aware that this transition will be taking place, but it is extremely important that we ensure that the transition is as smooth as possible. Given the experience of other jurisdictions after the centralisation of their services, however, I anticipate that this transition will be far from smooth, far from smooth, and that by the stay of execution, if you like, that they have given us by winding up this, this or making one service available in July, but, but keeping the offices open essentially until the December. A lot of that will be to deflect the, the blame for the roughness of transition onto DVA and onto us here as a devolved assembly. Uh, John McAllister. Mr. McAllister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, could I say, during this uh, whole um, consultation process. I think it has been one time that this Assembly has spoken with one united voice in opposition to this, and I commend uh, you know, the cross-party approach and the commitment of the, the workers affected up in Coleraine for garnering that support. Um, could I ask the Minister what plans he has to actually bring together all of the stakeholders now involved, his ministerial colleagues, uh, the local council, um, all of the interested
bodies to see what can be done to, with regard to redeployment right across government or indeed encouraging in other private sector investors and holding is very strong commitment about holding, making sure the UK government steps up to the plate and does helps out financially with this. I uh, thank the member for the question. As I've stated, I believe it's vital that we retain the, the unity that we have had thus far in this debate. And it is a matter that has unified the House. And that has given heart to employees up there. And to this day, despite the bad news that they received last week, it still gives them heart, the heart that there is something that we can agree on, there's something that we can work on for them. And it's that, I believe, that will ensure that we do keep working for them to ensure their opportunities hereafter are as good as possible. Mr. Speaker, I want to commend the workers in Korean and elsewhere for the very tenacious campaign that they led and their union as well. Uh, the failure is not theirs. The failure is the failure of government to listen. Uh, and indeed, uh, I suppose the failure of politicians here, despite best endeavours to persuade. When the minister reflects on the decision, is there any part of him which, which maybe embraces the unthinkable, that when a devolved institution such as this wishes to drag its feet on something like welfare reform, that it makes it much more difficult to then persuade Westminster on other issues where we're looking a favour in this regard. And can the minister tell us, since these people do not work in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, how can the devolved institutions afford to them transfers to within the Northern Ireland Civil Service? I think it's evident who has failed here, and it's also evident that to who they have failed, the workers. I spoke before about the success of this campaign in unifying the Assembly, which it did, and ultimately and sadly the campaign hasn't been successful in saving these jobs. By tying this debate into something like welfare reform, I, I can see where the members are coming from. But it's actually quite pertinent as well, given that many of these staff, should we not be able to get redeployed, should not we not be able to find work to go into Coleraine for, they will actually find themselves seeking benefits, seeking help from the government. And should welfare reform go through as proposed, quite a lot of them wouldn't be able to get it for at least a year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think we all share the frustration, disappointment, and anger at last week's uh, statement in relation to this. And I know that uh, those affected uh, in my own constituency in Ballymoney and Bush Mills and the surrounding areas that do work in the, uh, in the county hall are very concerned about this issue. But one of the things that the member for East London Derry uh, asked the, the minister to do was to go down to Coleraine. But will he ensure before he goes to Coleraine, do, as he said in his statement, Bring, cert bring some certainty to the staff affected, because while we all want to be there to give support, we do not want to give the staff that are in County Hall a full sense of security and hope, and we want to be able to deliver to them something which is real and tangible and in a shorter time frame than the disgraceful delay in terms of this announcement being made. Well, I certainly would rather go there with that certainty and able to provide that certainty. I have, as I also said in my statement, initiated uh, conversations and communications with my executive colleagues and also facilitated in many cases by the, the MP for East D Derry as well. And he, like all elected members of that area, like all elected members in the, the, this House, want to get this sorted out, want to be able to give that certainty, want to be able to give some sort of assurance to the people there. But I think the assurance that we can give them in the immediate future, that we can give them today, is, that, is an assurance that we haven't forgotten about them and that we won't. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers and indeed for indeed showing the passion they have shown in this particular subject. But can I ask him what lessons are there to be learned 
when decisions such like this are made in Westminster, well, what weight do they put on the, the, the people who live here in the north? And can I ask him what weight he puts on anything that Stephen Hammond will tell him from here on in? Well, I think it says a lot about what weight that Westminster puts on what happens here in the north. It says a lot about what weight they put on us as a devolved institution when our first and deputy first minister have raised this issue on two or sorry three occasions with the prime minister we were assured that this decision would be taken at the highest political level now i don't know if the prime minister is the highest political level <laughs> in england but it's certainly not a good decision it's certainly not a popular decision what lessons can we learn i think we have to learn I think we can learn a lot from how we have approached it and in doing so together. And I think a lesson that the House as a whole has learned is maybe a lesson that some of us on one side of the House might have learned long ago about uh, what value you can place on words from certain sources. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. The major bulk of the job losses was in coal rain, and the ministers talked about being creative and seeking support from all our ministerial colleagues, writing across the water for more financial support. What assurances can I give the House that any support and further underpinning for the jobs in coal rain that he can give also applies to those employees in the smaller offices, the likes of Ballymena? I thank the member for the question, and, and I can assure him I in no way intend to or have attempted to differentiate them between employees in any location. However, given that the majority of these employees, 240 in fact, are located in Coleraine, that's where most of my answers have been focused. The economic impact on Coleraine will obviously be crushing. However, I recognise fully the impact that this will have on individuals and families and other towns across the north where uh, services have been withdrawn. However, as I've said, I intend to treat all the staff equally and give them the same equality of opportunity. That includes this item of business. Order members, Ms. Sandra Oberlein has given notice of an urgent order question to the Minister of Justice. Again, if members wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise, should rise continue in their places. Uh, uh, Ms. Oberlein once again will be called automatically. Minister. Oh, sorry. Clark, read the question. Um, to ask the Minister of Justice for an update on the development of the police, prison and fire officer training centre facility at Desert Creek in Cookstown. Now the Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, within the last week, the programme board was made aware that the preferred bidder was experiencing a number of cost pressures within the supply chain regarding the tender to build the new Northern Ireland Community Safety College at Desert Creek. There were a number of media reports on the issue, but the position remains that the preferred bidder has not withdrawn its tender and discussions between them and the programme team are ongoing. It would not be appropriate for me to comment any further on those discussions due to the commercial sensitivities. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for that response. Uh, not only do the training of uh, police and other community safety personnel uh, deserve better, but so does uh, the local economy of Cookstown and the surrounding area, uh, which has been very enthusiastic regarding the opportunities that this uh, project brings to Desert Crate and uh, that whole area. A strong message of support is required by the Ministers. and. Uh, and so I'm asked the question of the Minister in taking this project forward. Um, it seems that the options are either a cut back on the cost of the project, which may mean it's no longer a state of the art a project, or find the additional money to fund the project as it is. Um, what is the Minister's preference? And I also want to ask him what is the likelihood of the project needing to be re tendered? Well, Mr Speaker, as I said, the current process is underway. The specific issue which Mrs Overen raises about functionality, certainly a significant amount of cost has been taken out recently, somewhere in the region of £20 million. But I have been assured by the programme board that that has not affected the functionality of the college. It has simply been a matter of dealing with matters to get the best possible value for money. It remains my commitment to ensure that we get that integrated college in place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, design team Perkins and Will uh, has cost in the region of £8.5 million, of which £6 million has been paid already 
that company has admitted uh, failure on its part in underestimating the costs. Uh, what assurances has the Minister received uh, that this project actually can be delivered, uh, given that it now stands at £157 million when originally it was £140 million? And does he share the view of Judith Gillespie, who is in charge of this project, that uh, she told the committee back in uh, August that she remained convinced that this was still a viable programme? Does he share that optimism? Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Given and other members of the Justice Committee will have the opportunity to have discussions with uh, the new chair of the programme board, uh, Mr. Finlay, um, and others at thir uh, Thursday's meeting, so I can perhaps leave it to them to explore the detail of it. Um, I, have certainly, uh, I share the concerns which is raised about the issue of the, uh, the inability of consultants <laughs> to get their work right. I understand that the programme board is taking legal advice on that particular issue. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers to date. The Minister, in, in his opening remarks, in, in answer to a question, said that the preferred bidder has not withdrawn uh, their, their bid, but has the preferred bidder made any indication that they can't proceed with the current cost? Well, Mr. Speaker, I do need to be careful on the, the commercial sensitivities. It is my understanding that a statement was made by somebody who had uh, connections to one part of the consortium last week, uh, which was rejected by the consortium as a whole. That is why the process is still underway. But clearly, that is something which will be teased out over the coming days. Dolores Kelly, Mrs. Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, can we afford not to build the, the police college, given that? Uh, each of the services which have bought in to share the site all require their facilities to be upgraded. Perhaps the Minister would give us an indication of what the budget set aside in terms of that work uh, and, in fact, uh, whether or not the budget would be sufficient uh, to meet uh, modern standards. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid Mrs. Kelly is encouraging me to get a bit too close into the commercial sensitivities. But members are aware, as I've just said to Mrs. Overend, that something in the region of £20 billion cost has been taken out in terms of the discussions which have proceeded with the preferred bidder in order to ensure that the costs can be, you know, can be fitted within the available budget and we still have a college which is fit for purpose and meets the needs of all three services. Clearly, and I, I cannot speak for the Fire and Rescue Service, uh, which is responsibility for the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, but it is uh, certainly clear to me that the police service needs something better than their current facilities at Garneville, and the prison service needs something better than their current facilities at Mill Isle. There were real opportunities, and there remain real opportunities, to get a world-class facility to meet the needs of the three services together, which will clearly be of major benefit to Northern Ireland. Bottle McRae, Mr McRae. Mr Speaker, Minister, how can you take £20 million out of a project and still say you're going to get the same functionality? Well, with respect, Mr. Speaker, that is a question for the programme board, not for me. But I've outlined at different times parts of the work which is being done uh, to reduce that. Um, that, for example, some of the roads which were planned were planned for a higher standard that was necessary for the actual use in training, as opposed to how a similar road will be constructed for public use. There have been uh, a, a number of different initiatives around that, which have shown that it is possible to take that money out to satisfy the programme board that functionality is not lost, but it will be a matter for the programme board to give uh, answers to the detail of that question. Uh, Jim Allister. Mr Allister. Thank you. Minister, does the problem here not go back to the fact that the preferred bidder was given the flexibility to reprice the job, uh, other bidders being unable to uh, come anywhere near what they then were claiming they could do and then had to reprice it back into reality. Is it not then that it should have been retendered? Is that not the mistake that was made and will that mistake now be rectified? Well, Mr Speaker, I repeat to Mr Allister that the process is currently underway, so there is not, this is not the time to do anything. Uh, the specific issue about the preferred bidder being uh, given the opportunity, as he describes it, to retender was not exactly that. It was a matter of discussion with the preferred bidder about elements of the contract which did not affection, affect the functionality to make uh, reductions within the various bills of quantity. That is something which was entirely in line with legal advice and was uh, certainly advised to, to both departments and to the programme board as the best way forward. 
Ian McRae. Mr. McRae. Here, uh, the Minister will be aware that the, part of the reason for the £20 million have to be cut off the the um, tender was down to the miscalculating of the tender in the first place. So it's maybe not the case that £20 million has been cut off, but it was the wrong figure to start off with. But can the Minister ensure the House and indeed the people um, and the economy um, that will get, be affected by this in, the, in my constituency, that a full investigation will be carried out into this as to why we've got ourselves into this mess? And can I um, give a any reason why this wasn't retendered in the first place whenever the, the mess was, was found out? Well, I can certainly share the concerns which Mr McRae and other constituency members have around the scheme as a whole. Um, as he describes the, the issue of the mess, the specific issue of the consultants having failed in their duty, I've already said, is an issue uh, which is now uh, a matter for potential legal concern between the programme board and uh, those consultants. But the issue as to how uh, the programme board then proceeded was in line with advice from senior counsel as the best way to move forward, given the issue of the tenders that were submitted being significantly higher than had been indicated by the consultants as an appropriate cost. That is where the position currently stands and that is how work is continuing at this time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the update. Some months ago it was indicated that unless the contract was signed at that stage, that the terms would have expired. Then the contract was, as I understand it, agreed. Can the Minister now indicate if, and I know he's reluctant to do this, if there is a requirement for a retendering process at the moment? Simple yes or no? No, Mr Speaker. Jim Wells. Mr. It is a real scandal, Minister, not the fact that the consultants responsible for this debacle have continued to be paid. Throughout all the warnings his department received, they still got their money. And secondly, my understanding is not only will the first tender withdraw, but the second tender is making it clear that his company will not stand by their next lowest tender. What happens if those issues become evident? Well, I'm not sure of exactly what bills were, were paid by the programme board to the consultant. Mr Wells seems to be better informed on that than me. Similarly, um, given that I have said that the current process is underway with the preferred bidder, it's not for me to at this stage comment on what might happen if the preferred bidder to withdraw. But there are you know, issues which clearly need to be examined, and that is a matter for the programme board, which is clearly uh, something which is not current while the current position remains that the preferred bidder has not formally withdrawn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's a feeling of bewilderment outside this assembly uh, that we're in yet another mess in relation to a, a big capital project. And yet the consultants who assisted and advised in relation to this project have received £6 million. Are we living in the real world where people who mess up get £6 million? And will the Minister uh, assure this House that that £6 million will be retrieved from those consultants? Well, Mr Speaker, certainly we all share concerns about those consultants who so grossly misunderestimated the, the cost of the scheme as was set up. Uh, but I think we need to be very careful as to exactly how much money has been spent on which consultant. I don't think those who are responsible for that particular error uh, have been paid £6 million. So uh, let's not exaggerate the problem while it clearly is a significant problem with regard to that group of consultants. Order, members. That includes this item of business. And I want to ask I just take his ease.